Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome this second Sunday of Easter. So glad that you are here. We are, are in what in the olden days we used to call the, uh, the season of Easter tide. Still do in some places in the uh, in Christendom, call it Easter Tide, but uh, we call it the second Sunday of Easter, and uh, it is still, in, in other words, it is still Easter. We are still celebrating Easter, and will for a few more weeks until Pentecost. Uh, the announcements are, as you'll find them uh, printed in the bulletin, we are uh, glad again that you are here. If you're a visitor, we especially uh welcome you with us and hope that you will um, enter into the spirit of the worship here at New Dublin Presbyterian Church. Uh, are there announcements that we need to make? Richard? You look really good. He's dressed for the rodeo. So did you hear that? That the rodeo's going on across the street over at the fairgrounds. And everybody's welcome, and it's no, no cost of admission. But you have to pay for your hot dogs. Yes, Rodney. <laughs> Is it 3 o'clock, really? 3 o'clock, something like that? All right, everybody, everybody hear that. Uh, so just because, if it, just because it's getting dark doesn't mean it's the end of the world. <laughs> uh, it's an eclipse. Anything else? Uh, Jane. Flash drive has been left in the computer. If you're missing it, well, it's for you. Teresa. Uh, I had just uh, two tickets and changed in the back of the field. If anybody is missing the tickets, I would ask uh, anybody who has any there. Uh, if you feel that you're eager, if you want to uh, final announcement, uh, this is uh, first Sunday of the month, it's Communion Sunday, and everyone, visitors, uh, please know that you are invited to uh, receive the sacrament this morning. It's the Lord's table, it's not our table, it is not fenced or guarded in any way, for the grace of God is extended to all persons. Amen. Amen. Uh, if there are no more announcements, let us prepare our hearts for the worship of the living God. Thank you. Could the congregation stand for our 
responsive call to worship taken from the psalm of the day, Psalm 116. What shall we return to the Lord for all the good things God has done for us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. May the Lord's name be praised. Our hymn is number 118 in the blue book. Please be seated. Are there children that would like to come forward? Got Ava up here, Carter, Blue, Trey, Trey, anybody else? Come on up here, brother. No? Okay. No, no, no. My goodness, look at that pretty dress. Wow, wow. Hey, everybody. Hey. Hey. All right, come, come on up, Daddy. Come on up, Daddy. Hello, everyone. Everybody's got a sucker. Well, just about everybody. Um, what have I got on my tie? You see? What you see? The ants on my tie? You see them? Ants. You see that you see the ants on my tie, honey? See the ants on my tie? Look like them. Now, now if these ants, these are not real ants, are they? They're just stitched into here. But if they were real ants, and they were I'd be I'd be going like this, wouldn't I? I'd be going, oh, and they and they might be biting me and I and and, and I'd be and it You have real ants at home? Do you have them running around in the kitchen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, it's okay. That's all right. It's okay. Yes. So, mm-hmm. um, it would hurt if they were fire ants. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Well, we don't, we don't have a lot of fire ants. Maybe we have some. We don't have a lot of fire ants here. Uh, but but um, we, we're glad we don't. We're glad we don't, because fire ants are bad news. Bad news. Um, the reason I have ants on my tie, oh, I, I, I wear this tie every now and then anyway, but I, I wore them today because there's a, you don't know what a quote is, there's a line in the bulletin that I put in there that says, uh, doubt, I know you're not going to understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking to the adults right now on your behalf. Uh, doubt is the ants in the pants of faith. <laughs> so uh, that, that, that ants, if, I, if these were real ants, it would make me, it would make me 
uh, fidget, wouldn't it, if they were real ants all over me, okay? And, and, and one thing about it, if I had ants crawling all over me, I would be wide awake, wouldn't I? I wouldn't be sleeping through it. I'd be wide awake. And sometimes that's the way life is. Sometimes that's the way life is. When we are troubled, sad, angry, doubtful, whatever. We're troubled. That's when we're most alive and most awake. And God can work with us and help us. So remember, when you're feeling sad or when you're feeling lonesome or when you're feeling angry, Always turn to God and say, what are you trying to tell me, Lord? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this day and for all you give us and for love and help us to love you like you love us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, then. I like a man that knows what he wants. We are so fortunate to have, I know you are aware of this, but so fortunate to have these children. And I would, um, of course, invite you <coughs> to invite others to church. Uh, I used to say that <coughs> every week, and I've sort of gotten off of that. I don't, I shouldn't. Uh, please, if you're... Um, you know children that need that would like to in, that would enjoy being part of our fellowship with these children if you know uh you have neighbors or coworkers or friends that need to be uh need to be exposed to this community of God's people invite them to come to church um that's the best way to that's the way best way to uh To fill the church with the, the with with the, with the spirit of fellowship is to is for by word of mouth, word of mouth. Um, let us pray, Lord. We thank you for these children and for their parents, and for uh, a community of um, struggling, uh, faithful people. And, and and we acknowledge that we're not all that we ought to be, but we ask that you would help us to become more what we ought to be by your living presence in our lives. Um, and, um, and we begin our worship today uh, that you, we ask that you would, would bless our worship. And we begin our worship by confessing our sins for we have fallen so very short of, uh, of your intention for us. We know that. Uh, but we believe that you, be that you love us uh, despite our failings. And you receive us. And so in that confidence and with penitent and humble hearts, we make our prayer of confession together. Almighty God, we acknowledge that we belong to you and that you hold the keys of death and life. Yet we have sought to preserve old ways of living rather than embracing the new life you have given us. We have disbelieved your good news even when its signs are all around us. Almighty God, we acknowledge mm. that we belong to you and that you hold the keys of death and life. Yet we have sought, sought to preserve the old ways of living rather than embracing the new life you have given us. We have disbelieved your good news even when its signs are all around us. Amen. Hear these words of pardon. Um, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting and is given to you and me and extended to us through our Lord Christ. Uh, friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ.
thank you so much. Um, our gospel text, which alone I, w I will read alone uh, today, not the Acts text, although the Acts text is uh, <clears throat> very interesting, and <clears throat> you may maybe ought to read that on your own. <clears throat> but um, what we're going to do now is we're going to read this very, it comes up in the lectionary uh, every year, the second Sunday of uh, Easter. <clears throat> um, and I, I, I'm not sure that uh, John 20, 19 through 31, which is the story of uh, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John, and this, but primarily the story of um, Thomas, the disciple, whom we call Doubting Thomas, Didymus, D Doubting Thomas, the twin Didymus. But um, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that John... 19 is really, I mean, John 20 is really about doubt, but um, I'm going to preach about doubt this morning because it's something I know a lot about. Um, I know a great deal about doubt. I could, uh, I could talk all afternoon about doubt, but I assure you I won't. Um, <coughs> Hear now the word of the Lord. Let us pray. <coughs> the Lord bless the reading of your word, and uh, <coughs> we pray that we might all receive a word from among these words, <clears throat> a word that will uh, help us and encourage us and strengthen us to be your people. In Christ we pray, amen. Uh, <clears throat> when it was evening on that day, that is uh, <clears throat> Sunday, Easter, first Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, and Jesus came, among, came and stood among them. So he came through the locked doors, right? And said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And uh, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So John's account of this is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If any of you, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. <clears throat> so a week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them this time. And although the doors were shut, Jesus again came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. <clears throat> and Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to them, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, that's us, and yet have come to believe. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. <clears throat> One of my favorite authors is a fellow by the name of Frederick Beekner, And um, I put a quote of his in the bulletin this morning, uh, just below the uh, sermon title. Whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you do not have any doubts, you are either kidding yourself or a slave. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. <clears throat> so says Frederick Beekner. And some other person somewhere, and I don't know who it was, has said something that I think is even uh, more striking in its truth and profundity, and that is that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but the opposite of faith is certainty. 
chew on that for a minute. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. If you're certain of something, you don't have to have any faith at all. Let us pray. Lord, um, <clears throat> may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. May my words be a reflection of your truth. Amen. Uh, Jesus said to Thomas, Peace be with you. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Uh, this sermon is addressed to people who doubt. I suppose in a way that is all of us, although I have known many people who have told me that they have no doubts and wonder how it's possible when I've expressed my own doubts, how it's possible uh, to live with the doubt, with doubt. Uh, some people evidently think that they have no doubts at all. Well, okay for them. <clears throat> but so today's sermon perhaps is not for everyone, but only for those of us who struggle with doubts. Though our gospel lesson raises a number of interesting questions, one of the things that we find most interesting, I think, is the story of Thomas, that figure. We're drawn to Thomas because... We can understand Thomas's position, can't we? He wasn't there. Everybody told him that, yeah, we've seen the Lord. He said, right, right. You've seen the Lord, right. And then he does see the Lord and receives the gracious message, peace be with you. I mean, many of us identify with Thomas in his doubt. Well, we can sing and we give assent to the Easter faith that Jesus, who was died, was raised to life on the third day. That's a good thing that we do. And perhaps it's even better to say that we really want, hope, desire that that news is true, and we're willing to live as though it were true. But many of us say and do that with our fingers crossed. We really hope that this story is true because so much is riding on it. <clears throat> so much rides on the truth or falsehood of the resurrection of Christ. It's the center of the Christian faith, actually, and also the hardest of all things to believe, that the one who is dead is risen. Not just to say so idealistically or conceptually, but really. Our doubts about this vex us if we allow them to. Are you a person that allows your doubts to vex you, or do you push them back into the closet, believing that's what God would have you to do? <coughs> like Thomas, we would like to touch and see, I think. But we cannot. We realize that Jesus is talking about us when he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. What we have to lean on objectively and with respect to the evidence is a series of accounts that were written long ago a tradition that we hold dear, that our grandparents told us about, but it is one that the world at large seem, sees as increasingly questionable, and to our culture, it is viewed as irrelevant. So how do we make peace with our doubts? That's a question I know very well. To be a preacher and to be doubtful, uh, I guess, goes together because you uh, think about these things all the time. And I have not made peace with my doubts, but I'm coming closer to it all the time. First thing, and so I'm going to tell you about what I think, okay? So you have to put up with me. This is not an expository sermon, but I'm just going to tell you what I think. 
Because doubt, doubting is a large part of living and certainly a large part of faithful living. Uh, and the first thing I would say is that believing the New Testament reports of the resurrection is not simple blind faith. To be a Christian does not mean that one has to check one's brain at the door. Whatever else happened in the days surrounding Jesus' death, I think we all ought to be able to recognize that something really big happened. These people that on one day were cowering and hiding for fear that they too would be put to death somehow gathered up the nerve to spread the message of the resurrection of Jesus around the known world in a couple of generations. And they were willing to do anything and endure any hardship, even death, to do so. Now, I realize that people do some crazy stuff in the name of religious zeal. And in the last few decades, we've seen a lot of that, haven't we? But I fail to see a possible motive for this action, this going, putting your, their lives at danger, going around the world. I fail to see a possible motive for this action if they thought that the Lord of whom they spoke were a man like any other and dead and gone. I don't believe they believed that. That's not what they said and did. They said the opposite. And Paul tells us in Corinthians that Hundreds of people saw and experienced the risen Christ. Is their witness a simple fabrication? Well, it might be. A hallucination? Might be. Wish fulfillment? Might be. But to me, that in itself would be difficult to believe. That doesn't make it true, though, does it? Further, let us consider the accounts themselves in the most general way. The New Testament tells us of a remarkable man, Jesus of Nazareth in a way that is laced with irony and matter-of-factness, the Gospels tell us about his life and teaching, and they don't always agree. They tell us of one who even the most skeptical among us must admit expressed in what he said and in his actions a wholly unexpected truth. We have become so used to it because we've heard it so much, but a wholly unexpected Expected truth. A truth about humans and about God, a truth that it that is backwards to the way our minds think, backwards to the world's view of things, backward to our own self-interest, backward to rationality. He tells us, and we know somewhere deep inside of us that it is true that it is in losing our lives in the service of God and neighbor that we find them. In him, if we will look, we see the love of God expressed. In his death, we see that love given entirely, if we will look. We look at him, and if we are the least bit sensitive in feeling, we are drawn to him, even if we don't understand what it is that draws us. The story, the man himself has, as J.B. Phillips once said, the ring of truth, the story of Jesus has the ring of truth about it. What he says and what it means rings true. It explains so much about life. It explains so much about why things are so messed up. If the story of Jesus is a true story, it explains why, why it explains almost everything. It explains our failures and our human condition like nothing and nobody else. Is it possible then that he is the Christ? Is it possible that he is not just another man but God revealed? Or was he a simple fool? And all who followed him and have followed him through the centuries fools as well. Possibility. If he is the one sent from God to show us God and God's love, then is it foolishness to believe that this one who died out of God's love was raised 
by the power of just such love? I do not believe so. It's not foolishness. I believe that it is reasonable to trust the truth of that message. Again, if this story is some sort of fabrication, I cannot imagine it coming to us in the form that it does. Who would make up a story like this anyway? A story where the resurrected Jesus, for instance, is so often unrecognized. Why? Why would you write it that way? Why would you write that the king of glory, God himself, becomes incarnate in a barn with the cows and the manure and the stink out behind an inn, lives his life, ends up being crucified between two thieves, is raised from the dead, nobody knows who he is. Why would you come up with a story like that? No. A story in which everybody has a different take on the actual events? Or are there one or two angels at the tomb? Depends on who you read, which gospel you read. How does a fellow who walks through walls, which is like in our text for this morning, also fix breakfast and share a meal in the next chapter over? How does a man who is not bound by space and time have scars in, on his body? Who makes such a story up? A God who dies at the hands of people who don't understand them and forgives them as they kill him? Who makes up a story like that? And if it is made up, it's a wonderful story, isn't it? If it is made up, it's a wonderful story. That's gonna, that probably should be my last point. But if it's made up, it, it seems to me it's worth living for, even if it's made up. Believe me, I recognize the questions that the story of the resurrection raises. I know the doubts that haunt one who struggles with skepticism. I've read the books written by really smart people that attempt to debunk the whole New Testament, not just the resurrection. But I would tell you, although we don't seem to hear much about it these days, that there are many, 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 many highly intelligent people who believe, even though they have their doubts. The smartest people I have ever read, and I don't claim to be the most well-read person in the world, but the smartest people that I have ever read were defenders of this faith through the ages, the most brilliant musicians in Western culture and history, wrote music extolling the Christ. The most talented artists and sculptors and painters painted their hearts into works of art that pointed people to the risen Christ. And so to believe is to be in good company as if that were a reason to believe. All this is to establish that it's not unreasonable to have faith, that you're in pretty good company, and yet we still have our doubts, don't we? We wonder about the faith and what it might mean in this business of resurrection. And when Jesus meets doubting Thomas, his first words to him are not words to berate him for being faithless. Did you notice that? I'm not going to believe. When Jesus comes, he doesn't say, ah, you see? No, 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 no. He said, peace be with you. Because you see, even in the first century, people knew that dead people did not rise to new life. They knew that. We think of them as, you know, hayseed superstition. They knew better than that. Jesus understood Thomas, and Jesus understands you and me and our doubts. Faith is not knowledge. Faith is not knowledge. Faith is not certainty. Faith is trust. Trusting what is unknown and finding in that trust something or someone who is worthy of our trust. Faith is not mental assent to a list of doctrines and creeds and concepts, but the trust one puts in the truth of Christ for our daily living. Faith and doubt are not mutually exclusive. They walk together side by side and will for most of us until we reach the other side. 
Indeed, it is the prayerful dialogue of doubt and faith that is the greatest opportunities for faith's growth in my life anyway. Faith unexamined, faith untried, is most often untrusted. It is one thing to say we believe that God leads. It is quite another to step out not knowing what tomorrow will bring and doubting that God will lead and still to trust God for your leading. If God is God, God can handle your questions. If God is God, God can handle your doubts. Do not be afraid of them. Do not let them paralyze you. Do not think that you're a lousy Christian if you have them. Finally, I have found that it is possible to make peace with doubt. We moderns, we want to make sure of everything, yet we're sure of nothing. The older I get, the more I understand that life is short. And the only things that really matter are the things that really matter. And most of the things that I take on faith, like the reality of beauty in the world and the goodness of life, like trusting in the love of my wonderful wife, even when I can't love myself, like believing in the importance of honor and friendship and faithfulness to those who are counting on you, like believing that life is not about what you can get for yourself but is to, believe, but, but is to be lived generously and openly, with hands open and not closed. These greatest values in life are not certainties. The greatest possible matter to take on faith is the Christian message. What would it look like if God were to come to us, live for us, die for us? What would life after death look like if somehow God were to show it to us. Resurrection? I find that the Gospels and their message compel me to trust them even as I struggle with doubt, as I know most of you do. My appeal to you is that you make peace with your doubt. You may find that when you give up requiring a faith that has no reservations, real trust will follow. Just because something is unimaginable doesn't mean that it isn't real. The best things in life are unimaginable gifts. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Amen. Let us stand and sing hymn number 399. We walk by faith and not by sight. That's in the blue book.
Please remain standing and let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You will find that in the laminated uh, page in the pew if you need to. Together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. In response to the grace of God, which we received this morning in word and in sacrament, through our faith, by the grace of God and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose living presence is among us, in response to all that, let us receive our offering of tithes and gifts. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Jim. These gifts are our way of saying thank you, Lord, and our way of saying to you that we would live for you. As we are able, we would give ourselves to you. We pray that you would receive us and receive these gifts and use us and use them to your purpose now and forever. In Christ we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, we're going to, rather than take requests for prayers, uh, we'll have a short time of silence. We invite you to make your prayers aloud or uh, silently. Let us pray. Uh, Lord, we give you thanks that you have not asked us to uh, be certain about things in this life, but to trust you. Uh, we ask that you would help us to be more trusting every day. We trust 
as we are able the message of your grace given to us in Christ, of your love that has come to us when we did not deserve it and forgiven us of our sins, of your love which is victorious over death in the grave and has ra- has, that you were raised from the dead and, have, and live now among us. We pray that your spirit, the spirit of the risen Christ, would bind us together with one another and with you and with our neighbors outside the walls of this church that we might love one another as you have loved us. Deliver us from skepticism that is paralyzing. Deliver us from the fear that we will somehow find out that we've been fools. Help us to look for the reality of your presence in the day-to-day and show yourself to us in ways that we can't imagine. May others see you in us as we struggle to be your people. And may we see you in others and in this glorious world that is around us. Make us good stewards of it all, we pray. Hear our prayers now as we make them silently for others and for our world or aloud. We pray for the sad, for the hungry, for the grieving. We pray for the needy and the fearful. We pray for those who are sick of body and sick of soul and mind. We pray for those whose hearts and lives are circumscribed by hatred and violence. We pray for the innocents that are caught in the crossfire of (coughs) the pride of men and nations. We ask that you would show us your way and that your kingdom would come, your will be done. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for us. Amen. Um, If we believe, if we trust, not knowing, believe, if we believe that somehow on Good Friday, God, God was present on a hill outside of Jerusalem, and that it was the infinite God that died on that cross in some fashion I can't begin to understand. But if we believe that God died on that cross outside of Jerusalem, then surely the love of God is is infinite and extends to you and to me and to all people everywhere. There is no limit to it because it is the infinite God who dies and gives himself in love. And so this table is for you because that same one who died said, do this in remembrance of me and my act of love for you. And don't turn away from it and don't say, oh, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, because you are. He makes you that way through his infinite love extended to you. Come, receive the Lord's Holy Supper. You are invited. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right in our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O 
Lord, our God, who has placed us in this beautiful world that you have made and made us stewards of life, the life of all things and the lives of one another and our neighbors. We thank you that in this life that we lead, as we struggle to be faithful, that you are present with us and that your love is always with us and nothing can separate us from it because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. So we thank you, Lord, for the message of grace that is to us and to our neighbors that we are beloved of you and made your children so now, Lord, we pray that you would take these elements of bread and this cup and that you would set up them apart from any common use to this holy use and mystery, that they may be for us who come as we come with our struggling faith. They may be for us the body and blood of Christ broken and shed for us and that they might nourish us to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote that I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that on the night on which he was betrayed, our Lord took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. Could the elders come forward, please? This is the body of Christ. Eat you all of it.
together the prayer after communion printed in the bulletin. God of grace, your son Jesus Christ, left us this holy meal of bread and wine in which we share his body and blood. May we who have celebrated this sign of his great love show in our lives the fruits of his redemption. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, amen. Our final hymn is 106 in the blue book. Go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. Remember that God understands your doubts, and God can use your doubts to strengthen, ironically, your faith. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.